Welcome back, it's the World Soccer Talk Podcast, the only podcast that focuses on watching soccer on TV, online and apps. In episode 115, we discuss NBC delivers the second most watched game in Premier League history, how a new so- soccer streaming service is giving MLS a bad look, reaction to US women's lawsuit against USSF, plus letters from you, the listeners, in our mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris aka the gaffer and i'm joined by my co-host kartik krishnar kartik it's been a crazy week i know for you and for me for different reasons uh, all of it soccer related um whether it's travel soccer or just uh, the start of uh, kind of a new domestic season uh for the american leagues but um from this past week what was uh, the highlights what was the big match that you watched that you thought okay this is it i, I, I love it uh, that's that that that's a really good question because I think obviously uh, the match I was one of the matches I was most excited about was the was the Brom Villa match at St Andrews and, and we all know what happened ten minutes into that match with with uh, poor Jack Grealish so <laughs> I guess I would say it was probably unfortunately Juve Atleti I mean I thought this was going to be a showdown between Ronaldo and the most organized stout defense uh, in world football and guess what Atleti was so negative so and we're just playing at the edge of their box the uh, their own area the entire match and and, and rightly got beat mm-hmm. yeah for, for me this past week and and in terms of my highlights of uh, my match of the week and some listeners may faint at this Kartik, but my match of the week was lafc against portland and this is a game i watched uh, on fs1 over the weekend uh, just an incredible atmosphere uh, at the at the stadium there in los angeles uh, the game was played at a feverish pitch, the uh, pace on the pitch, uh, just a really fast moving, um, just just open ended game back and forth. Portland early on had some great chances and it looked like that Portland could, could actually kind of pull off a, a shock victory here. Uh, but eventually it became uh, pretty clear that uh, LAFC would win this one pretty comfortably. But I was impressed. I was I thought uh, in terms of television, in terms of uh, the spectacle, the atmosphere, uh, in some ways that Stu Holden and John Strong, it was ha- actually hard to hear them at times when they were talking just because the, the, na- the noise of the crowd was so, so great. And they st- they sang through the entire match. And I thought that that was a really good atmosphere uh, in primetime television on FS1. And I enjoyed it. In terms of the Champions League context, so you, you were kind of mentioning uh, the Juve game, which, which was a great game. Fantastic performance, of course, by Cristiano Ronaldo. Now that we know who are in the final eight in this tournament, um, I think it's, it's time to have a little bit of fun just for a few minutes. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, during the time that Fox Sports held the rights to the Champions League from 2009 to 2018, um, they must have been hoping that one of those finals would have been either El Clasico with Real Madrid against Barcelona or... Uh, better yet, in some ways, in, in terms of their audience and their target demographic at the time, a all Premier League final with, you mean, kind of the, the Chelsea against Man City or whoever it may be. Those two things never happened. And the way that we, we're now going into the quarterfinals with four of the teams from the Premier League in the final eight of the Champions League, there's a pretty good chance. I mean, there, we, we don't know anything yet, but there's a pretty good chance that there might be an all Premier League final. Uh, if not, uh, you would hope that uh, one of those teams would make you through to that final match, having what fifty percent of the teams in the the final eight. But for you, Kartik, what what would be kind of what what would TNT want that uh, dream Champions League final to be? Which two teams would they want in that fi- that dream final? Barcelona against either Liverpool or Manchester United. Yeah, I, I was I was thinking about this one earlier, so. Um, I mean, and that'd be a great match. I mean, obviously, definitely the, the Barcelona-Man United kind of a rematch uh, from way back when in the early 2000s or mid-2000s. Uh, that would be fantastic. I think in some ways, though, Barcelona against Juventus would be a perfect final for Univision. So anytime you're going to have Barcelona in the final, I think it's going to skew definitely uh, to Univision with, with some big numbers there. Uh, I'm sure they're, they're dreaming of that. To me... You mean it's probably the final? It would either be a Manchester derby or a um, 
Manchester United against Liverpool in the final, which in some ways would be kind of, you mean, I don't know, anticlimactic in some ways. But once the, the, the match happened, once the game kicked off, those would be some monster ratings. Um, at the same time, though, too, you, mean, you never know. Ajax could be through. I mean, they've got uh, the, the way that they play. You can't count them out in terms of just their just brilliance in terms of sheer energy and atta- attacking abilities. Um, but it's set up to be, I think, what, what should be a really interesting final eight. So we'll find out for a lot of the listeners to uh, listening to the podcast. Uh, if you listen to this podcast on Friday, you'll probably already know who's in that final eight, as well as what uh, the final four would look like in terms of who who needs to beat who to make it into the semifinals. But it's set up for what should be a really interesting uh, rest of the Champions League. And the group stage uh, was so-so. Uh, the knockout stage has been fantastic. The, the thing I have to wonder, though, Kartik, is whether or not uh, we could see... I mean, right now, the final is set to be on TNT. But depending on who, on who was in that final, I wonder if they would consider switching that match and putting that on TBS, if, if it would be an El Clasico. Um, well, not El Clasico, but it would be a, a Ronaldo against Messi final. Um, but, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Uh, I'm sure, because they keep all their NBA games on TNT these days, and that includes conference final. And uh, uh, though they do, they have played the NCAA tournament final on TV. So that's it, I, that, that. That's a good question. And, and also, um, in the midst of this, it looks like there's a realignment in terms of who is going to be leading uh, sports programming at Turner. Uh, it's going to be Jeff Zucker, apparently, uh, who who runs CNN worldwide. So uh, who's from? Miami originally, by the way. Um, so that, that that might I don't know if this would be like the first test uh, when after he takes over of, of, of a network realignment. But uh, it's interesting. Interesting time for sure. Yeah. And as far as some of the other games uh, from the Champions League, um, what I would mention, too, is actually Stu Holden, I, I believe, has really progressed um, a lot in the last six months working at TNT. I mean, in terms of his t- tactical analysis, uh, pre-match or even halftime, but pre-match especially when he's going uh, to the tactics board, it's really worth watching. And um Every time he does it, I always learn something from it. And, and actually, it's, it's one of those things that uh, I'm contemplating recording it for my kids to watch who play travel soccer, just to take a look at that and see about I mean, positioning, matchups on the pitch, those types of things, which I think are important for anyone, whether you're a player or a fan of the football. But uh, overall, with TNT this past week, I, w- I think they've found a comfort zone. I think they've found a spot now where... Uh, they're emphasizing the tactics, and they're doing, doing a great job at it. Uh, there's no jokes. There's very few mistakes. Um, the chemistry is better. Uh, when Tim Howard's on the set, it, it's always better. Uh, and this week, too, with uh, being in Los Angeles, I think really helped a lot, too. So I think they've found a place where I think from here on, hopefully it'll be um, some good success for them. Now, Kartik, from this past week, uh, obviously some big games, the Arsenal Man United game. Uh, you mentioned the Birmingham um, Aston Villa game and the the incident that happened in that match. Um, did you catch the Liverpool Burnley halftime uh, analysis talking about the uh, the Birmingham derby? Yeah, yeah, uh, about Grealish. So that was that was really good to see NBC actually kind of suspend their normal just kind of Premier League analysis and what was going on in the match that they were uh, that they were covering to uh, to cover this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's one of those things that um, they had to switch gears pretty quickly. And uh, I missed it personally. I was at a, a travel soccer game, so I missed it. But um, the reports I heard back were very positive. And uh, and then it always helps, too, to have people in the studio that, who can talk firsthand about being involved in big derbies and, and having incidents happening on the pitch and, and uh, what it feels like as a player uh, to go through that and also what it's like playing in a derby. I mean, it definitely is, is a, a huge, huge uh, occasion in terms of the, the intensity. And we've seen that just in the last few weeks, the intensity of the pitch, and oftentimes that sometimes carries into the, uh, into the stands, into the stadiums, where there's that intensity too, and really hatred between uh, these clubs, between these clubs' fans. So um, an unfortunate incident, definitely, but, um, but good job there for NBC... Uh, SN to cover that uh, during that halftime at Liverpool Burnley. 
let, let me point out that I think this is a benefit of the synergy with Sky. I do not think a year ago or even six months ago they would have they would have been able to pivot so quickly. So uh, there are benefits. I know we 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 we've gone after Sky the last few weeks on this show and the NBC uh, relationship, the Comcast relationship, but uh, I think this is one real positive from that. Yeah, I think part of it too, Kartik, is too, they're probably feeling their way through this in terms of trying to figure out, uh, NBCSN that is, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work and trying to see what's available to them. Um, In some ways, in terms of uh, Sky Sports and Sky Sports News, there's just so much coverage and so much uh, probably things that they can go to to actually incorporate into their broadcasts. Uh, My concern since day one of this synergy is is, is really kind of making sure that NBC keeps their unique identity, that they don't become kind of a NBCSN slash Sky Sports. Sky Sports definitely has their identity, which is very different than NBCSN. Um, And we've seen in the last few weeks that um, they've begun begun to kind of blend a little bit from the NBCSN side. Uh, hopefully they'll they'll kind of pick and choose you mean the things that, that probably work well for them that that maybe it's people um you mean at, at the scene or or resources that they, that they don't have right now but uh yeah so we'll, hopefully they'll they'll make some wise, wise decisions there now Kartik, uh one more thing before we move on to tv streaming news and that is that uh, i know that you caught something very interesting uh for, speaking of sky sports from Neil Ashton on their Sunday supplement program that's available um, through the United Kingdom on Sky Sports Television, but you get you got a chance to see it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I am able to to access it, and all I would would say for the U.S. audiences, you can get it legally via Apple Podcasts, just the audio version. Uh, so it's it's not illegal to to, to listen to it uh, in in the states. Uh, yeah, Neil Ashton hosts the, the Sunday Show Sunday Supplement, which is uh, generally a, a roundtable discussion with other soccer writers, uh, acclaimed soccer writers like the Patty Barclays of the world, uh, etc. And this week he. Uh, much to my surprise, because I've watched Sky Sports News and, and they act like uh, women's football doesn't exist. Um, he, he brought the U.S. women's national team gender discrimination lawsuit up very early in the show after discussions about Pochettino and uh, Real Madrid and, and, and all of that. Gareth Bale, uh, all, all the, 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 the sexy headlines, so to speak, uh, had a very uh, – Good discussion with it about it with with, with Patty Barclay and and uh, one or two others. Uh, I'm blanking out on who else was was on the show, but they're they're all names. They're all people we know, and uh, it was a very enlightened discussion, educated discussion. Learned a lot from, them. and then they went on to talk about the She Believes Cup and England's prospects and and the job. Uh, Gary Neville, uh, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> Phil. Phil Neville's doing, yeah. Um, yeah, I do that from time to time, sorry, uh, that Phil, Phil Neville's doing with the England uh, team and also mentioned, uh, and this was important for me as, I, as I've done a couple of shows now on the U.S. performance, she believes, and on the U.S. lawsuit, a couple of shows uh, for other out, uh, media outlets, Chris, that Phil Neville, when he took the job, took over from Mark Sampson, demanded the women be given, uh, England women, be given equal travel arrangements to the men uh, and the FA conceded uh, that to him. And, and, and uh, that is a part of the U S women's national team lawsuit. If you read the full complaint, there are about seven or eight important points in the U S women's national team lawsuit. But um, Chris, there was a better discussion led by Neil Ashton with a, with British journalists sitting around the table about uh, this lawsuit. And quite frankly, his role in, in, in the women's game and, and how, uh, I mean, they took a, a few pokes at us really being kind of an also ran in the men's game and the leader in the women's game. So I had a lot of sympathy for the U.S. women based on that. Um, but it's a discussion we have not yet had on the American media outlets, even the ones that tend to be to challenge um, uh, U.S. soccer and, and MLS more. I, I mean, we've had some discussion of it, and I applaud Alexi Lawless. I mean, he, he 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 has actually tried to tackle the subject. Others have just run away from it or, or, or spent their time talking about MLS or whatever, whatever else, um, or the champion you know, UEFA Champions League, whatever. But, um, but, but because, I, I was surprised that there was such an enlightened discussion in the UK and not here. But but Alexi Lawless is, is, is kind of uh, analysis of this. Is this through Twitter or is this through television or is this through? Uh his podcast. Well, he, he 
he, well, through his podcast, and 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 uh, you can see it on YouTube, right? Okay, so I guess that is important, uh, Chris. It was not on Fox, right? Exactly. And we had some. It was on uh, his podcast. I mean, the lawsuit happened on Friday, which was uh, International Women's Day. Fox had broadcast on Sunday. I think it was Sunday night. Uh, the uh, LAFC Port- Portland game, so that would have been a great opportunity to kind of talk talk about that in, in depth. Um, I missed the ESPN FC this past week, and I didn't catch uh, the Bean Sports uh, extra. So maybe they went into knowing Bean Sports, they probably tackled it, but I, I missed it. Um, so there's definitely a couple of outlets that could have discussed it, but um, it is interesting, Carter, that you note that it's Sky Sports in the United Kingdom. Uh, in a program that's focused on, you know, fo- is broadcast in the United Kingdom, they're they're targeting the United Kingdom. Yes, you can vi- get it through a podcast through iTunes, but it's really for a UK audience. So that that that's definitely eye opening there. Uh, the one thing I would say about Sunday Supplement, which I thoroughly recommend, is that um, if you're not seeing the visuals and you're just listening to the podcast, you're not missing anything because all it is is that um, Neil Ashton as the host. Um, many of us know through NBCSN's coverage, uh, but really what it is is Neil Ashton hosting it, and then like usually two to three journalists uh, sitting ra- around a table just discussing it. And usually it's John Cross from I think the Mirror, um, Patty Barkley, and and so on and so forth. So it, it's interesting because it's it's kind of a very intellectual, intelligent discussions about serious topics, and and Neil does a great job with that too. So definitely check that out and. Uh, Thank you, Kartik, for uh, mentioning that and catching that, because otherwise um, I'd have missed it. All right, let's move on to TV streaming news. And Kartik, uh, I want you to kick this one off and to give your analysis and opinion about this, because it's, uh, it's been a big story the last few weeks um, in Major League Soccer. Yeah, and it was, uh, I know FC Cincinnati has a real, uh, a real uh, nice, shiny look on their brand-new team, but timing was very awkward. So what happened, if, if you're not aware, is Flow Sports – the new local broadcast partner for DC United, an OTT service, which is $150 a year for access to DC United. Unless you're a season ticket holder, then you can then you can get away with paying only $71. Uh, this is after DC United has been on uh, free-to-air television or local cable television for the la- for the first 24, however many years MLS has been around, first 23 years. Week one, there were all kinds of streaming problems. There were people at watch parties, Chris. There was a, uh, a DC United official watch party uh, in the district. There was a Barra Brava uh, watch party, which is a big supporters group, uh, also in the district. I know of a big watch party in Loudoun County, Virginia. Also, those three parties I know about, they were streaming problems and uh, issues with uh, the service. So Flow Sports, by the way, has offered full refunds to DC United fans who aren't satisfied. And uh, and uh, I don't know if anyone's taking them up on this. On the very same day, everybody was talking about these streaming problems. FC Cincinnati foregoed signing an agreement with Fox Sports Ohio or, or one of those uh, networks uh, in, in that area and uh, decided to do the same deal, kind of deal with Flow Sports, uh, which, again, is an OTT provider. They'll charge a lot of money for FC Cincinnati broadcasts, and they announced it the same day as everyone was freaking out uh, about the D.C. United New York City FC game. So um, – MLS, I always thought, was really good at spin and, and controlling the message, but this was another really optically horrible thing and a horrible day to announce that broadcast deal. Yeah, there's so many ways to look at this in terms of how bad this is. To me, it's a bad look for Major League Soccer because it makes them appear to be a small-time player. Um, yes, it's a bad look for Flow, Flow Sports and DC United and FC Cincinnati, but it is for MLS too. I mean, to me... Whether it's maybe Flow Sports was offering more money, maybe I'm sure they've been backed by some VCs. Maybe they're offering more money to uh, clubs like DC United or, or FC Cincinnati into, uh, in comparison to a local broadcaster on television. And then maybe that's what they went for. Maybe they went for the money rather than for the distribution. And the distribution, especially for Major League Soccer teams, is key. That's something that you want to have. You want to get those, I mean, as many uh, households as possible. Uh, aware of of your local uh, team and and also even for people that kind of channel channel surfing going through the different channels on their local cable uh, station 
and finding it by accident and then saying, hey, let me watch this game. And we've heard countless stories of how that's happened to soccer fans, diehard soccer fans now, but that's how they started in, into watching soccer, I mean, just coming across a game by accident. You're not going to come across a game by accident with Flow Sports. And it's, it's a shame, really, too, because it's one of those things that um, – the feedback I read in terms of everything that went wrong with the DC United opening weekends, including not sending any broadcast crew to NYCFC into New York, just up 95, not, not that far of a journey, uh, but instead of doing the, the actual broadcast remote, um, it, it's, it's really a, b- a bad look. I mean, it's one of those things that I found out about later is there's been so many other people that have been complaining about Flow Sports because they have Flow Wrestling, they have Flow... I mean, all sorts of different sports, like probably a long list of, of, of 20 different sports. It's not a good look. And, and it's something that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more deals announced in the near future where Flow Sports is uh, working together. Last but not least, Flow Sports is headquartered and based out of Austin, Texas. <laughs> right. Of all the cities to have this PR disaster happen, it's Austin. Just Just as soon as they're out of the news, with everything that's been happening with uh, Save the Crew, here we go with Austin back back on the picture. And and it's it's if you live in Austin, um, I'm, I'm sorry for you. It's it's kind of it's another <laughs> b- bad I, mark I, against them. I, I have to I, have, I just have to laugh about that because I found out about the FC Cincinnati deal before FC Cincinnati put out a press release because it was in the Austin American Statesman and it had the Flow Sports president or co-founder or, or, or something talking about their deal with FC Cincinnati uh, in the context of everything else going on. And I, I, I actually found that Monday morning before yeah. <laughs> the press release from MLS and FC Cincinnati. So uh-huh. the Austin thing is, uh, yeah, I guess MLS has, is, is significantly invested in Austin now, as we know. Yeah, and, and even just the, the rollout of this, I mean, if it's a, if it's a brand new, which is Flow FC is, is the name of the stream, the soccer streaming part of Flow Sports. So it's a brand new site. It's a brand new uh, venture for Flow Sports going into soccer, broadcasting, you mean, some, some Major League Soccer. And, and also there's some other tournaments, too, they have the rights to. But uh, in terms of the public relations, the marketing rollout, which is non-existent as far as I can tell, uh, just an embarrassment. And, and again, too, it, it looks bad for Major League Soccer, too, at the same time. The last piece of news, Kartik, in this segment is that uh, Fanatis, which is the streaming service that covers a lot of uh, Latin American soccer, has now added Be In Sports Connect uh, to its list of channels. So it has Be In Sports, Be In Sports en Espanol, uh, Be In Sports Connect, as well as uh, Goal TV en Espanol, uh, TYC Sports, uh, all of the Superliga games, and, and more. And all of this, Copa Libertadores, Copa Sudamericana, so all of this is nine ninety nine a month, and uh, they've just announced a annual deal, which I believe then, if you pay annually, which is, I think, $99, it works out to be about eight twenty six a month, and, and you get access to all the BN Sports channels. Something to consider, um, definitely a good price point. I've been using Fanatis for about a year and haven't had any problems, so something to look forward to and, and we'll have more information about this at worldsoccertalk.com next up Kartik is TV ratings in the soccer world of the United States some big numbers um, Sunday's Arsenal against Manchester United game averaged 1.68 million viewers across NBC NBC Sports website uh, the NBC Sports app and Telemundo all together to rank as the second most watched live Premier League match in U.S. history. Um, The one that had more viewers than this one uh, still has the the number one uh, claim there. The top spot is the Manchester Derby, which had 1.72 million. And that was back uh, last year, actually, about a year ago. Huge numbers. Uh, And of course, on this one... with the time change, with with the, the clocks going forward in the United States, that benefited NBC because instead of having the game kicking off at uh, 11.30 uh, Eastern Time, as we're often uh, used to, uh, this game kicked off at 12.30 in the afternoon on over-the-air NBC, which had a huge, huge uh, impact there. 
Now, Kartik, some of the other numbers, some other big numbers that came out this week too. Um, Manchester City against Watford and NBC, 818,000 people watched this one. Uh, Chelsea against Wolves, 459,000 viewers. And um, one more, which was PSG against Man United. Last week's uh, Champions League match on TNT had 413,000 viewers. Now, looking at um, Major League Soccer, Kartik, um, Atlanta against Cincinnati was an ESPN, and uh, it's just been a horrible start for, for Atlanta so far this season. But uh, 354,000 viewers, so it dropped uh, from the previous week on ESPN. And um, the big one for me, Carter, out of all the numbers that came out this past week, was um, Crystal Palace against Brighton and Hove Albion. They had 50,000 more viewers watching this game than the MLS game in prime time on Sunday night, which was uh, LAFC against Portland. So you had a 7.30 a.m. kickoff on a Saturday morning, more viewers and between two teams that are relatively in a, in a relegation fight. I mean, the, the positions aren't, aren't safe yet, uh, with really not much of a brand recognition or not a lot of uh, soccer fans follow Palace and Brighton in the States. They do have supporters clubs, but not huge growing Massive numbers there. Um, had more viewers than the LAFC Portland game, which was a fantastic game. Uh, to me, that that screams uh, there's a problem there. All right, let's move on to listener mailbag. Uh, first up is Craig Shapiro. Uh, he says, uh, all right, fellas, real talk. I often agree with your assessments of soccer media, particularly in the pre, mid and post-match analysis. But when it comes to Bleacher Report and TNT, you are epically off base. It's terrible. Unwatchable crap, particularly Stu, who is awful. Kartik, uh, what's your take on this one? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, Cra- Cra- Craig is right that TNT just isn't there uh, and, and quite at the level we want them to to be, but it, it's just I think we have a point of reference, which is Fox, and there are some good bits of analysis in, in the midst of all the clunkiness uh, on TNT. We didn't get that on Fox at all in the last few years. I mean, it was almost as if Fox had mailed it in at the end. Um, granted, I mean, in fairness to Fox, the, the last season and a half of Champions League, uh, it wasn't officially announced the, the Turner deal, but we knew about it. Um, uh, 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 half a year before it actually was f- formally announced. So the last year and a half, they were um, they were operating knowing they had lost the rights. So mm-hmm. the commitment wasn't there. Yeah, the one thing that Craig says, and I replied to him on Twitter, but I didn't get a chance to read the reply or see the reply before we record this podcast, is whether he's talking about um, his his kind of analysis about TNT being uh, terrible and unwatchable. Whether or not that has anything to do with which games are on TNT. So, for example, you mean there's only one game on a Tuesday, only one game on a Wednesday. With Fox having one game on the FS1 and another one on FS2 uh, at the same time, or sometimes it was Fox Soccer Plus, sometimes it was your Fox Sports regional channels, whatever it may be. But the accessibility on television uh, was hugely is a huge factor, and a lot of people that the criticisms of TNT has been based on that, like, ah, TNT is terrible. At the end of the day, I think it's one of those things in terms of, if, if Craig is, is talking about the analysis, it's it's like anything in life, uh, in terms of movies, music, you name it. Uh, people have different tastes. And I think, for me personally, I think TNT is hitting all the, the right marks in terms of their analysis, uh, their unique pieces by Fernando Perez. We had some more this week. Uh, also, in terms of just the discussion, it's watchable. And that's something I could never say about Fox. Uh, my job is that I'm paid to watch soccer effectively. And with Fox Sports, I had to force myself to watch it because it became so predictable, so boring, so non-Champions League at times because they would have a whole segment about news that was happening in Major League Soccer. I'm like, what has this got to do with the Champions League? And I would give TNT full credit. They, they've had a lot of problems they fixed those problems, but every single second that they have is focused on the Champions League, and, and that is a huge plus. Uh, and hopefully it will grow from there in terms of the viewers and uh, become more successful. JP has uh, a lot to say about the last podcast where we talked about MLS ratings. 
and the issues uh, surrounding that. Uh, JP says, I think Chris is close to articulating the cause of MLS's rating issues. Soccer fans have a multitude of options to satisfy their soccer itch. At the risk of being labelled a Euro snob by MLS fans, the quality of play is often much better elsewhere and becomes glaring when viewing MLS in comparison. I am just one example, but only can stomach most MLS in the summer when that comparison is less fresh. I compare it to watching the NHL following a winter Olympic cycle when the NHL allowed players to, to participate. For a few weeks after the NHL uh, game seemed to be so much slower, uh, would need time to readjust and find the same enjoyment as before the Olympics. And let me just pause there for a second and say that JP does actually do a really good thing, and which, which is a smart thing. I think uh, any, any listeners that are interested in doing this, um, he went ahead and went to worldsoccertalk.com and then posted it in the comments section uh, under the podcast and actually said, okay, I watched like four or five games this past weekend uh, from Major League Soccer as a test and described what each one of them was like and whether it was watchable. I think out of those four or five only one of them was a really highlight. One, one was one he was really excited about, about, and that happened to be also LAFC against Portland. Uh, the others had, I mean, whether it's, I mean, it were just kind of uh, boring games like the NYCFC, the DC United game, or so on and so forth. The, the Atlanta Cincinnati game, where you kind of think that uh, um, the actual acoustics of that stadium. If you're in that stadium. In, in person, I'm sure it's amazing. On television, it sounds like crap. It, you, you don't see much of the crowds, the way that the cameras are angled. And I'm sure it's a great atmosphere, but it does not come across on television. It sounds very echoey, very like a closed stadium. It's just not a good atmosphere. Anyway, so, so JP goes into more length about what his experience was uh, in the comments section. Now, JP goes on to say, I really don't know how MLS can counteract this problem. To be honest, their focus on live attendance over TV ratings is probably wise in the long term of the league. Good attendance and mediocre ratings is a more sustainable uh, is more sustainable than ratings without attendance. I think they should shorten the schedule to what it used to be in the early days, April to October, if I remember co- correctly bigger picture as a compromise between the pro-rail supporters and detractors, regional MLS leagues where the top two to three teams qualify for a US slash Canada wide tournament like the Champions League that would also be played during the season. So definitely some good feedback there and some some good suggestions by JP. Last but not least, uh, Jose Rodriguez says, hey guys, love the show as always. I came across an article on Twitter from US Open Cup They are not affiliated with the actual tournament, but just bring news and information about it. They stated that there are plans for the U.S. Soccer Federation to broadcast every match from the the tournament nationally. The article even goes on to state that uh, teams will need to hire more workers and have the ability for a broadcast truck to be at the event as well. I believe this is the right direction to go in for the tournament to get the recognition, recognition it deserves. My question is, do you know what partner they will go to? My assumption, my assumption is ESPN Plus, uh, Jose says. Now, Jose, what I would say is don't get your hopes up because we've been hearing quite a lot of news. Well, not, 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 not a lot of news, but we've been hearing for several weeks about just wait. There's going to be a broadcast partner announced that's going to broadcast the U.S. Open Cup. And I say don't get your hopes up because I, I don't believe it until I see it. I mean, the U.S. Open Cup has always been been really bottom of the totem pole in terms of the attention given to it by um, USSF, really, and Major League Soccer. I'm not expecting much. The article does say, in quotes, um, the details of the new broadcast arrangement have not been released, but an announcement is ex- expected soon. Well, that was a week ago. We still haven't heard anything. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. Kartik, as far as your... Uh, network and contacts and insights uh have you heard anything or and and if not uh any thoughts where that u.s open cup cup coverage might go um i'm guessing it's mike cujo who does a lot of lower division 
soccer matches in the U.S. or Flow Sports, who we've talked about earlier oh in the show. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know who it would be. Now, now I have to say one thing, and, and I know so many people out there, is particularly in the Twitterverse, are huge fans of the U.S. Open Cup. I am too, but I've worked in lower soccer. I continue to work in lower division soccer. It's a lot of costs that are incurred if you stream games at a high level. So uh, it might actually be a better compromise for a lot of the clubs that are in the early rounds to go through a, one of those sorts. Well, not sports, but Mike Ujo or something uh, lower key than ESPN+. Plus. But we'll see. Uh, it, it has to be done soon. Uh, the Open Cup kicks off uh, in in. The next uh, world qualifying ends uh, uh, in three weeks, so the Open Cup will kick off soon after that. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, I mean, to me, it's you have to spend money to make money, and if USSF is going to put it on Mike Cujo or Flow Sports, I mean, that does not help the US Open Cup in the future in terms of making that more of a commercially successful operation. Uh, to me, my guess would be YouTube. I'm just having all the games on YouTube, and and that's something that's very accessible. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably not what Jose is expecting, and it's not going to make it make it a success. But that's my guess. Hopefully, uh, uh, I'll be surprised, and hopefully, it'll be on something much greater. All right, guys, if you have any questions for us, uh, feedback, rants, raves, tips, uh, you name it, you can reach us via email through web at worldsoccertalk dot com, as well as facebook dot com slash worldsoccertalk and on Twitter at World Soccer Talk. Plus, of course, you can always, always post your comments on worldsoccertalk.com. Now, Kartik, before we uh, go, uh, where can users and listeners um, find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me at KKFLA737 on Twitter. Cool. And I'm at, uh, at World Soccer Talk. So thank you for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, Audioboom, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. If you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review. Kartik heading into another big weekend. This one filled with a lot of FA Cup matches, including Manchester City, your team against my team, Swansea City. Ah, I love it. But what should they do? Enjoy your football. <laughs>